from the Danish School of Design. And um, I was lucky back in the day to get a, a job for Levi Strauss and Company and was transferred to San Francisco in 93. Um, and I've been here ever since I married and have my daughter. Um, I left Levi's in 2009 and started my own business. So I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, my husband runs a coffee, black owned coffee company. And I run my own little store um, that is now only online. And in 2018, um, I met Frederica and uh, we started what is currently our business together, which is All Power to the People Project, um, which she will tell more about. But basically in short terms, it's a, it's a collection of um, using the trademark uh, of the Black Panther Party and All Power to the People, which is owned by Frederica and she can talk more about that. Um, but we created a brand that we hope can inspire a younger generation to um, empower them to you know, take the words and the experience and the legacy of the Black Panther Party and the Huey P. Newton um, to the future. There's a whole generation out there who is rediscovering um, all the great work that was done in the past. And um, our brand is a kind of more of a, you can say almost like a, it's a, it's a message statement um, to bring that to, to a younger generation through uh, clothing and apparel. Mm -hmm. Kind of it, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. And mm -hmm. uh, Frederica, would you? Hi. Hi, I'm Frederica Newton. Um, thanks, LaVon, and thank you, Raquel. And I'm here in Oakland, California as well. I was a member of the Black Panther Party. My uh, late husband was the co-founder, uh, Dr. Huey P. Newton. And I co-founded a nonprofit. Oh, gosh, it's been about 26 years ago. It's hard to believe it's been that long. I said the other day, I need a raise. <laughs> of course, it's a volunteer organization. Well, I'm a volunteer, of course. But um, we started this, I started this along with David Hilliard, who was chief of staff of the Black Panther Party. So he was in leadership as after Huey died to promote and interpret the history of the Black Panther Party, because there's been, um, you know, there's so very little written, particularly at that time, about the party that told the truth, basically. Uh, the, the party's been denigrated, demonized, erased, um, bastardized, so to speak, um, in the media since its inception. And um, I was left the archives um, by Huey, and we knew that all of the, the true history of the party was in those archives and in those newspapers which was in publication for 13 years. It was a weekly publication. So that was our mission and, and continues to be our mission um, with this nonprofit. And uh, we've, we've been interpreting the history through art lately because it happens to be a passion of mine. And we've recently created um, a, a bronze statue of Dr. Newton who um, will be placed on this on the corner of the street where he took his last breath in October. We'll be uh, unveiling that that monument. Let and me show. It. Do you want to show it? Show it. Sure. Okay. You guys are getting a sneak preview of it. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Um. Oh, you did get the video. Okay. I did get it. Yeah, I just got it. I don't. I haven't been able to try it. But uh, this is uh, um, the man that's actually bronzing that piece. He, he isn't the creator of the money. He isn't the sculptor. Her name is Dana King. And she's, I think this is her sixth piece that she's done in her career. She's a black woman here in Oakland and her, her work has grown international acclaim. And she's, um, it's, it's wonderful because she's right here near my 
near my house. So I was able to work closely with her during the process of the creation of this. It was, we, I had a man come in who was a barber during, during the eighties to make sure his hair was right. And that was a very, very intense personal experience for, for actually for the both of us. And that will be placed, that monument is the first permanent public piece in Oakland, which is the birth birthplace of the Black Panther Party that shows that the Black Panther Party even existed in Oakland. So it, this is a, this is pretty historic Oops. that we'll be placing this piece um, October 24th. So uh, a little bit about my relationship with Raquel. Uh, she, we, we needed to protect, I needed to protect the trademark of all power to the people as well as the iconic cat and um, a couple of other things. And Raquel had a business that I loved, which is right across the street from the job when I was at that time working as a nurse. And um, I asked Raquel if she, if we could, if she could create a, um, first it was a business card. We were operating without a business card. <laughs> and then, um, then clothing. We used in the Black Panther Party art as an expression and an educational tool of the work that we did. And so it, it, you know, it made perfect sense that we take this art from um, actually art that was in the Black Panther Party newspaper weekly. It was an educational tool to wearing it on clothes. And um, if you'll look in the iconic, if you'll look in the old pictures of the Black Panther Party, you'll know that our, our image was very, very iconic. And we wanted to make sure that the we grew in from business cards to t-shirts to protect the trademark um, and to other pieces of merchandise. And, and we've been very, very, very careful to make sure that the, the message rings true with the message of the party, which was a message of freedom. It was a message of empowerment. It was a message of inclusion and um, and we did not want to um, trivialize or compromise this history in any kind of way. So we've been very, very careful about how we marketed, who we marketed to, and um, that this is a message that would ring true to everyone and also empower those who, who embrace this history. And um, so it's been a very rich experience working with her. And um, I'm very grateful to be working with LaVon and Jeanette on this project. The Black Panther Party's message was not national, it was international. So it makes sense that um, across the world at this very time, this, this, this iconic movement and, and person is, is in this other art piece. So, cause our, Huey talked about globalism before it was even coined, he called it intercommunalism. And that, um, I saw our message spread beyond communities and beyond nations, so. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, Thank you so much. I know we, um, Jeanette has yet to kind of introduce herself because she was also working on, there was some technical problems when we just got started. Um, but I'll let Jeanette do that. Um, just to kind of introduce herself and then we'll talk. Jeanette, are you able to still show the, the video? No, because I don't have it. So maybe you should, you could show it. I can, I can share the screen with you and you can show it. Okay. Um, I think I shared it. I mean, I made a multiple um, shared screen so you can do that, but maybe I should introduce myself first while you're finding the video. Hello everyone, um, I'm Jeanette Ehlers uh, and I'm a visual artist uh, based in Copenhagen uh, where I also grew up. Uh, my father is uh, from the, um, the Caribbean, from Trinidad and Tobago. My mother is Danish, so I grew up here. And um, my work um, revolves around um, issues of colonialism. Uh, when I first started out, it kind of was very focused on the Danish uh, participation in the uh, transatlantic enslavement trade. Um, and it, it also is still, but it also of course broadens out because this is a global story. Um, and uh, this is also why I'm so um, 
moved that um, we have this uh, talk today because as Frederica just said, uh, mentioned that um, the Black Panther Party is a global story, of course, also, and it was always meant to be global. So, um, yeah, so, so I'm just so um, happy that, uh, that we're going to talk about these issues. Um, I've been working with these issues for like 10 or more years. Um, and um, one of the pieces that I have done is a performance, is a live performance called Whip It Good, which is a performance in which I uh, whip or lash a white canvas with um, a whip that is dipped into crushed charcoal. And then I kind of beat the canvas and then I ask people to engage. So um, I've, I've performed this piece many times uh, globally. And one of the, the images from this performance uh, I can show you is actually uh, one of the inspirations to, um, to the I Am Queen Mary project uh, that we are going to talk about today. Let me just show you. Um, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the, the image that um, is on the right hand side is, is taken inside of the um, Royal Cast Collection, which was the um, Danish West Indian warehouse back in the days. And now it houses a lot of white uh, plaster sculptures. And so I took this image and of course, as you can see, it's, it's, really, it's, it's a reference to um, the iconic Hugh P. Newton image. And, um, and I just felt that by doing this, by kind of referencing this and by turning it also into a female position and also I, I use a whip in this image. Um, yeah, I kind of reached out and uh, connected with this whole history of resistance against uh, colonialism and uh, racist structures. So, um, and then in the process of doing I Am Queen Mary and when Lavon and I, we started working together um, this position we, we, we kept this position but we kind of changed the expression so the tools that uh, the character in the I am Queen Mary um, uh, I am Queen Mary uh, sculpture has uh, are these tools that you see right here um, the sugar bill uh, the, the, what is it called again bill uh, cane bill and um, a torch so instead of the whip, that is something that we, we changed and also the, the outfit and everything. But we actually have a little uh, video um, to show you so you can see some of the, some of the ideas behind. Do you, are, are you ready with that, Lavon? Yeah, uh, oh my gosh, I can't actually see what is on the screen right now. You can see it. Yeah, okay. we can see it, yeah. All right. The pose that we selected was a reinterpretation of the famous pose by Huey P. Newton, who was one of the leaders of the Black Panther Party, where he sits with a gun and a spear. And we decided to kind of recast ourselves, not only in that legacy as um, black women, but also the legacy, into the legacy of Queen Mary. So there's kind of multiple reenactments happening yeah. in the work. We have uh, merged our bodies to make a hybrid um, and a future uh, woman, uh, but also, I mean, it, it draws on old traditions, not only uh, European traditions, like in the ancient Egypt, they created these huge sculptures mm -hmm. sitting on plinths. So, I mean, we are drawing on African traditions also, um, and that's really a, a very significant point. Okay, so let me stop share. Um, so I actually would really like to jump in and just maybe ask a question of you, Frederica. I mean, you know, this, this image is iconic. Um, and when we're thinking about icons, it's almost like an instant memorial. It's, it's a kind of space that, um, you know, kind of encapsulates a cultural moment and creates a memory by which others can jump in and create different narratives. And there've been so many reinterpretations of that image, but it might be nice to hear you first speak about the creation of the original image. Um, I know when we when we had our 
our earlier conversations, you gave us some interesting behind the scenes stories about how that image was created and how even um, Dr. Newton felt about that image. So maybe it would be okay if you could share that. Sure. Um, I know that it wasn't his idea. It wasn't his idea to, to he, he was actually a pretty shy man. And so for him to be the center of, um, for him to be at center, front and center in that, in that picture was a little bit unnerving for him. It was Eldridge Cleaver's idea. So they went to his attorney's office at the time, attorney's house and Eldridge staged everything. And then he walked into the room and, and was kind of shocked from what I understand. Um, and was a little reticent to take the picture, but he did. And it became, it became a clarion call for, for black men and black women to see themselves in a position of, of power for once. Uh, this is right at the backdrop of the civil rights movement where the images of, of those courageous civil rights workers were one of being hosed and gunned down and, and um, with um, dogs sick on them. And, and the message was um, loved and turn the other cheek. And the message of um, the Black Panther Party was one of love as well, but it was to determine the power of your own destiny and to, and to defend your community and to fight against oppression and to fight against a police brutality and killings in your community. So this was a position of power. It wasn't a position of, of um, Huey chose the, ch the cat, the panther, um, because the panther did not attack, but only defended themselves when attacked. So we were a self-defense organization, but we were not gonna subject ourselves to the same treatment that was prevalent in the civil rights era. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. No, I, I think it definitely does. Um, how, I'm, I'm curious, however, if, um, if he lived to see how iconic that image became, like if other people were interpreting it while he was alive and if there were feelings around that or, um, cause I also, I think I also read somewhere that the, the chair, that image and that chair became so iconic that if he wasn't able to, to attend an event, the chair would stand in for him. That could be some misinformation. As you said, there's lots of misinformation, but I'm just curious about how the image um, within the party was, uh, how it was felt, how it was used. And, you know, since so many people from Beyonce to, I mean, there's just so many um, reinterpretations of that image, including our, ours. I'm curious about how that's been seen. That, that's fascinating that you say that because I hadn't heard about um, the wicker chair being placed there in his absence. I just did that recently. I just ah. have a, a wicker chair right behind that door behind me. And I use that not as a prop, but, but actually to um, cre recreate his presence in a, in a presentation that I did lately. So that wicker chair became a very powerful statement. And um, I think that we were so busy doing the work during those times, we didn't give a lot of thought to, uh, we didn't give a lot of thought to these kind of, uh, I don't know, as a rank and file member, I didn't, to the, to the in, intense messaging or, or the intense meaning behind it. But I know that it, it continues to be a message of empowerment and power. Uh, when you see that wicker chair, or even when you see leather jackets, you know there were there were um, many many men and women who owned a leather jacket and a beret and were not part of the Black Panther Party, but just by wearing those garments, you know, felt empowered and and um, and and felt that they could stand up for their own rights and the rights of their community. Um, just by virtue of the fact that they identified with the Black Panther Party and Huey's courage. This was a man who was in his mid twenties who stood up against the United States government saying that no more, we will not take this anymore. We, in the um, number one of the 10 point platform and the party was based on 10 point platform. It was, we want freedom. 
we want the power to determine the destiny of our black and oppressed communities. So this was new, this was a new stance and you had men and women who, who, who were, who young men and women who courageously were willing to lay their lives, put their lives on the line and shed blood. We had 28 members of our organization that were killed by the police out of love for their community. Mm. So it wasn't based on hate, it was definitely based on love. I think, um... And, you know, maybe Jeanette can also speak to this, but I think, you know, what, as we're kind of unfolding um, our inspiration and our connection into that image, you know, Mary Thomas and the selection of her um, came about um, thinking about the centennial anniversary of the Salem transfer from, uh, of the Virgin Islands, which was formerly the Danish West Indies from Denmark to the United States. And that 100 year anniversary occurred in 2017. And so as we were both um, invited to think through monuments projects separately, um, when we decided to work together and when we decided to um, align uh, this narrative um, and use Queen Mary as a symbol, you know, she in the Virgin Islands has emerged as probably one of the most uh, popular cultural heroines. Um, she emerges as a leader of a labor revolt that happened in 1878. Um, she originally was not from the Virgin Islands. She was an immigrant worker um, from the British island of Antigua. And although slavery had been abolished in 1848, she, um, you know, the living and working conditions in the territory um, in the colonies were so bad that at one point there was almost a 50% mortality rate. So if that gives you any sense of, of that people were literally being worked to death um, on, on these plantations. And so she, like hundreds of other people uh, on October 1st, which, is, which was contract day, which was um, typically a day that the contracts were signed before, so contract day was kind of a day of revelry, but that day is when they launched this major rebellion. Um, and they burnt down over about 50 plantations on the island of St. Croix and a good part of the town of Frederickstead in protest. Um, there were people who were shot on the spot for their participation in this labor revolt. And um, many others were arrested and kept in prison without trial for many years, actually. And she, among four women, were taken to Denmark um, so they were first sentenced to death and then they were later, their sentences were commuted. But I think for us, you know, even though that original image that Jeanette shown that the, the kind of sketch that was an image probably created in the early 1900s um, by a British doctor who had, who may or may not have seen her. Um, that, that image of her with the cane bill. I can show it again. The spear and the, and the flambeau or the torch um, we thought was were really very strong symbols as well in thinking about um, resistance, but it's also been highly criticized. Um, our, our sculpture has been at times, especially from the Danish context, criticized because in the Danish colonial archives, she's remembered as a terrorist, as an arsonist. Um, that's a very different memory, of course, that we have in the Virgin Islands as we sing folk songs about her. There's a highway named after her. But it kind of just shows um, how the archives can pull out different memories that circulate around our cultural heroines or heroes. Can I say uh, something? Just, mm -hmm. uh, I, I wouldn't say she's remembered as a terrorist because people didn't know about her. But people no, who have right. people who have looked into the archives has have seen or have experienced what was written about her in the archives. So the people who criticize it, they have really focused on that, you know, but she, but the thing is, is she was, she's never remembered because nobody knew about her really. And this is why, why this, yeah, this is also why this, why this uh, sculpture that we created is so important because now she was, she's a manifestation there. She's not only a manifestation of, of her character, but of course of the whole resistance character, but yeah, I just wanted to say that people didn't remember her, but... The, the I mean, I wanted to say that too, growing up in Denmark, um, mm -hmm. first of all, we never really talked about the colonial history of Denmark. 
And I had never, ever heard this story. And I mean, I lived there until I was 30 years old. And even through my high school day, anywhere where you could have any kind of his history education, um, it was never part of the history. And, uh, you know, if you ever been to Denmark, we have beautiful buildings and towers and um, that is like of copper. It is a, it's a beautiful historic city. And a lot of that uh, history comes from the money that was earned through using, um, you know, basically getting sugar and spices from the Caribbean islands. So it was like such a big part of the culture of Copenhagen, but we no one knows anything about it. I mean, it's 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 interesting and and almost like I don't know shocking now in my older age to realize that I lived there and it was never a conversation. Right, but we were walking amongst that beauty and the richness of, of where that wealth came from, and no one knew anything about it. Yeah, I, mean, I think um, I think for Virgin Islanders, it's also quite shocking because, as I mentioned, you know, we marry, we learn these songs to, about her from childhood, so it's a very much a part of our our cultural memory. So us kind of re introducing her um, back to Denmark by having this um, monument has been a significant um, act in terms of trying to penetrate the collective consciousness um, and the Danish ethos and the way that they remember themselves. But I thought that maybe this might be a good time to talk a little bit about um, our joint collaboration in terms of the t-shirt project and how that has aligned with um, as you mentioned before, uh, how apparel, how clothing was so significant to the Black Panther Party. Um, so maybe Raquel, because you actually yeah. were the first to kind of <laughs> come up with a mock design. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, as you learned about our project, um, mm -hmm. you're in, well, how you I mean, as a, yeah, as a, as a background also, uh, I've known Jeanette, um, uh, since she was 16 and I was probably about 20 something, uh, we go way back. And then we, we lost contact when I moved to the United States uh, in the early nineties. And then we reconnected. It was very interesting because I was home visiting my elderly mom and I I'm kind of can't sleep. And I'm looking at um, the documentary of Jeanette doing her art and we reconnected um, that time. And then we stayed in contact um, and Jeanette has visited Oakland and uh, also been introduced, always been curious about, you know, the Black Panther Party and, and was introduced uh, and attended different events here in, in Oakland um, for her own project. So it's always been this like little connection. Um, and interesting enough, I just also want to say that, that with Lavon, um, I saw your documentary even before I reconnected with Jeanette and was uh, my husband and I was watching the beautiful um, documentary about how you do your art and it was always on the back of my head and I had no idea that the two of you were connected in this way. So, um, so when I started to realize uh, and, and knew about Queen Mary and the sculpture and went and saw it, it was just such an interesting kind of epiphany that you know two people that I admire and have known or seen or heard about suddenly is like right there and we all connect it somehow and the same with Frederica and I who have created both a business together but also a strong friendship um, as business partner and, and as friends here in Oakland um, so the way we met was uh, I had my little store in downtown Oakland and Frederica like she said was working across the street and one day she came in and um, actually congratulated us because my husband and I run a black owned coffee company and we our one of our, um, what do you call it? Uh, keywords is beautiful coffee to the people. And when we wanted to trademark that, uh, we were told that the Black Panther owned that term and we had to ask their permission. So, that's what we did. And uh, my husband was a photographer back in the day. So he's done a lot of work with the Panthers. Um, so we got the permission and Frederica came in and congratulated me, which was like such an honor. And the first time I met her. And then we ended up creating a, a contact. And like she mentioned, 
she had to, for us, there's a lot uh, to do with the protection of the legacy and protection of the trademark. So when Frederica came in and said, you know, I actually need to do products to be able to protect this valuable inheritance that she had gotten from her husband, Huey. Um, you know, I was like, I will hands down be the one that will help you no matter what it takes. Um, so we had a lot of conversations about the type of product uh, with my background in the industry, uh, but also kind of the honor. And we talk a lot about that, the two of us about, there is a burden also of, of holding this legacy. It's not like you just create any products um, there's always this kind of heavy, there's a heavy burden and a, and a history that we feel like we want to honor every time we do something. So when we first started out, um, it was actually, it took us a while to be able to get this product off the ground, the first product, which is, uh, Frederica is wearing a, a t-shirt, but we actually came out with a locally made sweatshirt the first time that says all power to the people. And it had the Black Panther cat on the back. Um, and we were very deliberate about wanting to do something that we felt um, could connect a lot of people at that time. This is uh, three years ago, so it's before Black Lives Matter, it's before um, just this movement of people's, I think, consciousness are getting reignited. Um, but the Black Panther movie was coming out and it was a total coincidence. Um, and in a way not related, but related in the way that I think it has to do with empowerment and feeling proud about being black and, and also maybe even envisioning a world, which is the Black Panther movie did, right? Envisioning a world where black people are co totally in control of their own destiny and, and proudly kind of running their universe. Um, so we chose black, uh, all power to the people and it became for us a big success, our brand is small, but it became like we could not keep that sweatshirt in and we were running back and forth and giving up our own samples and, and selling them because everybody wanted to wear something when they went to see the movie. They wanted to wear something that had a statement or had some kind of, you know, it was like a day of pride in a way, uh, especially here in Oakland. Um, so that was really exciting. And after that, we realized we had something and, and we continued to create a little mini line of, of products. Um, and then, so it's always been something that we was, oh, sorry, I heard somebody say something, but it's always been um, something like even our t-shirts that Frederica is wearing is actually created and sewn here in Oakland. So that was also part of, something that we wanted to acknowledge was that we wanted it to be made here and have, you know, basically putting Oakland on the map in regards to um, this legacy. So that's something we've been working hard on. And when, and Frederick and I, like she talked about the international part of this has always been, a lot of times we sit there and we were like, well, we want this to be international. This is international. It's not just about America or Oakland. Um, but Rika can tell later, but she lived abroad in, in Paris when she was younger. And, you know, I'm basically like uh, a foreigner here, but living here for many years. So we always wanted to have this connection. So when, and I always told her about the Queen Mary, we've been following you guys' project. Um, and I think when we had this connection, it just felt so, so right, right? Like, I mean, it was kind of meant to be. So very exciting about this. And um, it was as usual, like when I did the first t-shirt, it was probably the dream job. And I think having to do the Queen Mary is the second one because um, it feels close to home from my past. And also it feels like a, a, an international or national co connection that, um, that is just so interesting and, and exciting and inspiring. Um, so just in the end for us, it has always been about messaging and it's always been actually our brand is not really about just selling a lot of t-shirts or sweatshirt. It's really about creating projects and that's why we call it All Power to the People Project because we're hoping to have these um, projects where we team up and collaborate with, with different people and different events. So um, 
you guys were the first international one and we were just really excited about being able to um, spread the word and help supporting your very important um, business because for us and for me personally to see this sculpture in um, in bronze would be like I mean fantastic I mean I think isn't it the first I have to ask you guys isn't it the first first of all, black image sculpture in Copenhagen, and then um, of, of even of that size, but just outdoor and a public space. Yeah, it's, um, thank you so much for, for this um, presentation also, but uh, yeah, it is the first sculpture of a black woman in public space um, in Denmark. There's a, another um, sculpture that was actually given from the Virgin Islands to Denmark called Freedom Sculpture, which is a, like a bust of um, um, a black person uh, with the conch, conch, what do you call it? Conch? conch. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is uh, also part of a, a bigger project where there's a, a sculpture in Copenhagen, in St. Croix. Is there also one in St. Thomas? Uh, I'm not sure, actually, there's one yeah. in St. Thomas. But then also in, in Ghana, I think. Uh, it's Bright Bimpong, um, an African. A sculptor who made it. So that was given from the Virgin Islands to Denmark, but before that, there was nothing. And then there's actually also um, a sculpt sculpture in uh, like this um, outskirts of Copenhagen, like in kind of far away from, from Copenhagen um, uh, of this, um, uh, what's his name again? Victor Cornelis, he was, uh, he was, um, he, he, he was taken away from the Virgin Islands when he was a little kid, and then he was taken to Denmark. He was uh, exposed in Tivoli um, for this, uh, what do you call it, uh, this huge exhibition that they had at this, that time where they, was sh they would show people from like um, all over the world, like uh, Greenland and the Virgin Islands, and you know, people, they were like being shown as uh, animals. But this, this, um, man, Victor Cornelius, he stayed in Denmark after uh, he grew up and he became a teacher here and he stayed in this like um, remote area. And then this uh, Danish artist, he made a sculpture of him. So that that has been there since 2016. So how was your sculpture? But it, but it, it, was, it was actually made in a different way because he was invited to do that. And, you know, yeah. it was like he, his, he was given that space um, mm -hmm. to do that. He's also a white male. So. <laughs> so how is your, how is the sculpture and the work that you guys are doing how is that received in Copenhagen and and even like to find the location and and get it done how has the feedback been from the Danish people I mean the location was given because this project started uh, by um, a researcher called Hellestenum a Danish researcher called Hellestenum who wanted to in, in relation to the centennial of the sale of the Virgin Islands or the, the former Danish Virgin Islands to the US. Uh, she, wanted, she wanted to create an exhibition where she wanted to connect the warehouse in Copenhagen with the warehouse in St. Croix. She wanted to reconnect those warehouses as they were in the back in the days. So she asked both Lavon and, and myself to think of a monument. So, and those monuments were to be outside of the uh, um, warehouses in, Denmark and in the Virgin Islands. So that was actually given. Um, so they are very site specific. It's very site specific, um, the one in Copenhagen. And um, I think to your question about how it has been received, I mean, we've got so much uh, when it was just um, erected, we got so much um, press coverage and a lot of people contacting us, uh, wanting to because this, we, we only created a temporary version because we didn't have uh, permanent permission and we, didn't have, we couldn't raise enough money to make it in Bronx, which is what we are trying to do now. Um, but people were really so overwhelmed and people call, uh, writing us, telling us they wanted to come to Copenhagen to see it and how they could help. You know, they wanted to donate money to us, you know, and you know, like they just wanted it to, to become permanent. So it's, it's, it has um, received a lot of great uh, response, but of course also a lot of critical response from Denmark as well as the Virgin Islands. And it's also had a lot of um, great response from the Virgin Islands, but maybe Lavon wanted to want to talk more about that. Um, 
Yeah, I, I actually was looking for the link to the crowdsource funding campaign to put it in yeah, the Yeah, I chat. have it here, I have it here, right here. And I lost my, where I am on Zoom, so I feel like I'm speaking into the ether right now. <laughs> no, <laughs> like I'm looking for the right um, the screen, I've got so many screens open. But um, yeah, the response in the Virgin Islands was very complex because um, as I mentioned, she was she is a cultural heroine and there have been lots lots of images created around her, everything from um, jewelry to uh, other paintings, um, banners, there's reenactments that have been done, there's plays that have been done, there are t-shirts that have been done. So there's photographs, there's all kinds of, I mean, her, her image has been recreated by many different artists and many different formats and mediums. And so, but ours was controversial for two, two reasons. Um, I mean, it was celebrated, of course, also because the fact that we did this project, the fact that this is the scale of the project, how it introduced um, this icon into a larger audience, but it also did receive some critical feedback because of one, um, the fact that we have her seated in this peacock chair. And um, the idea of Queen Mary is not like a European or even um, an African queen in that sense. It's really from an African Caribbean perspective of a queendom that's bestowed by the community. Um, it's not through the hereditary, um, it's through the imaginary. It's about who you can imagine yourself to be. Um, and so, and her title of queen, um, you know, that was not something that she appointed herself. That was something that would have been given to her by the community for her rebelliousness, her willing to fight down oppression and things like that. So by having her seated and especially having her in Copenhagen, there were those who kind of felt that maybe her, her legacy was being conflated with this European idea of queens because it looked more like a throne. Um, I think, you know, Frederica, you mentioned also um, maybe uh, Dr. Newton's ambivalence around uh, the, the royalty maybe that's, um, that's assumed in that image. Um, so I think we, we had to have those conversations as well when we talked to people here in the Virgin Islands about the project. And then if the other one was the fact that we used our bodies um, to create this image. And you know the use of our bodies actually really connects to really well to the project that we're doing with the apparel because um you know the use so much so much of the suppression is so much that it in it in it is a spiritual colonialism but it, it's you know it's it's an impact on the body in a very very profound way and the way that the body is another kind of archive and so for us to merge our two bodies as two women from opposite ends of the Atlantic was a beautiful bridge and trying to create something new, but also, you know, honoring the past legacies of our physical bodies and all that they hold. And so for me, what I think is really interesting about the t-shirt project um, in terms of visual messaging is the fact that the I am, this declaration of presence, which has always been a resistance tool against the dehumanization of colon colonialized colonialism and slavery um, is that that is kind of the forefront and then you see the the Queen Mary on the back and what maybe I like show about it. the design I, I can't see myself so maybe you can know <laughs> what is coming across okay, I, can do it. <laughs> um, I think what I really like about the the design is the openness of the I am um, you know it could be I am woman I am uh, man, um, as in the 1968 sanitation worker strike placards had, but it can, it, it's very open, um, but it still is. And it also could be just, I am <laughs> um, just that I, this declaration of, of, of a presence, which I think is really, really significant. Um, and so that's and what I think I'm most excited about. Yeah, yeah it's I'm like being seen. Um, I think even like with the, the history of not knowing, I mean, you did in the Virgin Islands, but like in Denmark where it's equally a, a, a history that should be remembered. So I think to be seen, um, and I think Queen Mary is being seen now, right? We, we And you're forcing their hand a little bit, which I also kind of like that you guys did. It's, it's like forcing the Danish 
uh, joint memory of like dealing with this, which, you know, is we going through here in the US, but I think in Denmark, they conveniently have been kind of like, well, we don't have to really talk about this. And, um, yeah. and since one knows we don't have to have this conversation and then suddenly you do, right? So. Sure. And it's really also about, I mean, one of the reasons why it was so important to have a figurative sculpture is because there's no representation of black bodies in public space in Denmark. It's like 98% represent white males. So it was so important to have this presence of a black body, a big manifestation of black bodies. Um, yeah, that was really, that is one of the main reasons why it became. And then of course, as Lavon said, to bridge our bodies is just because, I mean, also because we are, we're, um, visual artists, we use our bodies also. It's it's natural for us to use our bodies and just to use that as a tool. So it was really also in that sense so um, um, natural to do that. And we and now we created this new woman, this new uh, yeah, this new character. Uh, so that was really yeah, that was one of the reasons why we we chose to do that because. I mean, it's it's actually one of the, the critiques that it has got in Denmark is that it's figurative and because a lot of um, monuments nowadays, they are very abstract and very like formalistic in a way. So it, it a lot of people feel that this one is really old fashioned, which I can see why, but then again, we use high tech <laughs> um, techniques and also like to just, you know, this 3D merging and all of that is really high tech and, and it's really manipulated also. The, well, the I also think so. Uh, the, so again, back to the chair um, mm -hmm. and which is almost like a throne, right? But there is something very emotional. I think almost all people, even if they didn't really know about the Black Panther Party, I think still that image evokes something in a lot of people. Um, so I, I can see how emotionally people have to deal with whatever they heard or understood. Uh, and then maybe also similar to what Frederica talked about with Huey and the Black Panther Party, like the stories and the, the history that people have been told are not always the truth, right? But it sparks and it's been presented in different ways that it's still spark, even with people who don't know much about it, something. Right, and and they have to deal with that, with themselves, that conversation with themselves of what that is, and and why they either offended or uncomfortable or drawn to it. Mm. I just also wanted to mention though that the, um, you know, we didn't quite for this audience unfold the entire history of our project, but um, it is a kind of a combination of two monument proposals, and so the figurative component component is definitely comes more out of um, Jeanette's artistic practice, but the since the sculpture has been damaged in 2020 and the figure has been taken down, um, what's left are actually the coral stones, which was um, my interpretation of thinking through the materiality of the colonial experience and the and the labor. So those coral stones, which are actually what is holding the space right now as we're trying to raise money to make um, the monument permanent in both Denmark and also in the Virgin Islands is that these stones come, um, you know, they have been carved out of the ocean by enslaved workers and possibly as early as the 1700s. A lot of times they form the foundation of most colonial era buildings. And, but what ends up happening is because the Danish brick that was imported from Flensburg because they get placed on top of the buildings, you often don't see that. And I think that was kind of a metaphor for how, especially in European societies, we they often don't really see where the, the wealth of these societies um, came out of the colonial period and really came off of the backs of labor by enslaved Africans. And so what I think is really interesting is that, that on top of this plinth, on the the regality and the power of the figurative of the figure in the sculpture is really being supported by um, the survival 
um, and the material remnants of the survival, which we are also all material remnants of the survival of, of people of African descent. Um, and that that is, what I find interesting is this, um, this interplay, of this, this between absence and presence, because at this point it's a plinth that's standing there in the public space. And I think it's kind of interesting um, now there's a different kind of provocation as to what, what is missing or what was there. And I feel like the t-shirt project very much plays also with that idea of between absence and presence as you're kind of thinking through the statement of I am. And it also really connects beautifully to um, the importance of apparel in our project. Um, because, you know, even if you have no idea, we don't have a lot of texts on our monument, so there's nothing to describe who Queen Mary is. And that was a very, um, that was an artistic and political decision to not do that. Um, so what you're ending up seeing is you're having to wrestle with that lack of knowledge in a way. But at the same time, when you see a two and a half story sculpture in the public space, you're confronted with another episteme. You're confronted with the fact that other, obviously this figure is important because it's here and it kind of is a provocation to your own knowledge system. And in a, in a place that kind of centers European knowledge as, as the center, <laughs> um, it kind of shifts that, no, there are other people who have other cultural heroines. There are other people who have other knowledge systems that are equally important because obviously this figure is here. Um, so I just, I just find some of those provocations really interesting, but I did, as we're coming up to one o'clock, I wanted to see if there were people in our audience who wanted to ask us any questions, if they had any comments, we would, you know, cause we could of course go on to talking <laughs> on and on and on, but we really, um, you know, would like to honor your presence and um, would love to hear from you. And if anyone had any comments or questions, we could do that. Either you could do it just by doing it or you can put them in the chat. Uh, hello, I just want to say thank you very much. It was really interesting and I'm really grateful to hear. Uh, I'm planning to go down to Copenhagen. I'm stayed in Stockholm mm -hmm. and I will come in the end of October. And uh, I would like to ask something also about the state of the sculpture at the moment. You said it's gone now, but it's the, it's the um, fundament left. But there was somebody told me about it were some kind of augmented reality as well. Mm -hmm. That's true. Is it, possible to is it possible to find that in some way or? Sure. I mean, uh, if you go to um, the monument, you will find a QR code okay. and, and then you use your um, uh, phone, the, the camera on your smartphone, and then you will, you know, you will scan the code and then um, you'll have to kind of um, stand in front of the plinth and then the augmented reality version of the figure will appear. So you oh, can actually great. still see it and you can also walk yeah. around it. So it's, okay. it's really, yeah, so we had that made when the other one was damaged. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to um, probably, you know, remind some people who do know this, but others may not um, understand that this was a totally artist driven project. And so meaning that, you know, we've had to raise all the money ourselves. We deal with the permission, the insurance, the cost of that AR project. That's all been something that we've had to maintain. And so for the crowdsource funding campaign, it's really been um, the main purpose. Of course, you know, we're raising a lot more money that's within the crowdsource funding campaign, which our goal was around 100,000 US. Um, and our plan is to start hitting um, both Danish foundations and some US foundations to be able to um, raise the rest of the money. But it's also for us to be able to continue the project and make it viable because from everything from paying to get the coral stones cleaned to the insurance, to all of that, you know, Jeanette and I have assumed responsibility for that. So this is a way to ensure that the project can continue. Um, and has, it, has okay. the Danish government felt any responsibility of um, maybe offering some money back since, you know, half of our city was <laughs> made from, so there could be a way to give back and, and give a little repentance? Actually, we got, we got um, 1 million Danish krona from the Danish government. Um, but we can only get them if we raise the rest of the money. 
for oh. the for to create it. So that's also, I mean, we we have something to start off, and which is really nice, and we're very grateful for that. But we got the money before we got the permanent permission. So we couldn't start raising money before we got the permanent permission. So it's like, since this is like Lavon just said, an artist-driven project, there's so many steps, you know, so many levels that we have to go through. And, uh, but now we are finally <laughs> in these last, um, uh, yeah, steps in into getting the finance uh, in place, hopefully. Um, but we got the permanent permission from the Minister of Culture and, uh, yeah, in Denmark. Um, so, and, and the space is ours now, you know. Oh, great. Because they're also talking Northern about, mm -hmm. they all, sorry, they're also talking about selling the building, uh, the, the warehouse. But we were told that if they do that, we will still have this space for the sculpture. So oh. that's great. Yeah. And in the Virgin Islands, the process has been, I mean, you know, these are, you know, it's, it's a bureaucratic process and it's, because it doesn't come from the government or from an institution, but to artists, it it's very long. And in the Virgin Islands, we're still negotiating um, with the location that we've selected, which is a government-owned space. And you know, they've asked that we raise some funds before they consider giving us the permission because they they're afraid that the the uh, it's a very significant space. It's on the, the waterfront pier in Frederiksted, and so um, that's also a part of this this journey and making sure that we can raise funds and those funds are then dependent on whether or not we can get the permission to have it there but there's a lot of positive I mean most of the agencies agencies that we've spoken to want the sculpture they're excited about it um and I do want to just mention that we do have some questions that I want to yeah. um go through so Robert asked who Frederica and Raquel how does your project fit into the wider field of Black Panther Party alumni or legacy activities, if you could see it as a field? Um, are there other, other monument or memory work that's been going on? Or, I guess that's, I'm yeah, expanding on his question, sorry. <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for that question. It's, um, we support the, the work of the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation by giving a portion of our our, our profits to the foundation and to the work that it does. Um, initially, the entire profit was going to the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation from my end. And now we're trying to grow our business, but a significant portion of our, of our profit, I mean, of our, we, we donate to the work of the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation. That's um, part of the foundation of our business. And um, we, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't, was there anything you wanted to add, Raquel? And I can't remember. Well, I mean, <laughs> basically, um, in a way we exist to support the Hugh P. Newton Foundation. So the Hugh P. Newton Foundation that Frederica is running is a nonprofit organization uh, preserving the legacy of the Black Panther Party and the Hugh P. Newton. So for us, this is a, in a way, a more commercial way of, of supporting that, have a constant way of, of bringing in some, just um, what do you call it, uh, visibility. And also I think bringing in, like we said, a, maybe a younger generation who may not found the Hugh P. Newton Foundation by themselves, but they may be attracted to the product. We're living in a a new era but with social media and um, just a faster pace. And we felt like since the Panther always used the clothing as a way to show and bring in people and give pride in wearing something, we felt like having a, a message collection um, helps bringing in, sorry, helps bringing in um, just a, a, a broad audience. And, I, and also we felt there's something about wearing a t-shirt or wearing a message forces you to have a conversation, forces you to have an opinion um, and carrying it and, and have that kind of actual, what do you call it, conversation with another person um, by wearing this t-shirt. So for us, that was important. And then, um, yes, like Frederica says, we, we support the Hugh P. Newton Foundation with the sales that we do every year. I guess I, I think, I mean, I'm curious, you know, for example, um, with, for example, Fred Hampton or some of the other um, figures that have gotten a lot of attention, how do you fit in with that? Is there any relationship with some of their um, legacy work that they're doing? 
or do you, is there collaborations along cross party lines or cross legacy lines? I'm curious about that. Definitely. I'm actually support the Hampton House and the work of the Hampton House and raising funds for that. Where um, I'm in, I'm in weekly meetings with um, Chairman Fred and Mother Akua, and we became very close throughout this last year where I um, worked to support the work, the, the film, um, Judas and the Black Messiah. So uh, an, an, a relationship has evolved as a result of that. And we call it Sister Cities, Oakland and Chicago. They'll be coming out to support the, the installation of the bust. And I'm going to Chicago to support the, the work that they're doing. So, you know, so much has evolved from the work that Raquel and I are doing and the work of the foundation. You almost see it as one. You know, um, th th this is kind of the, the, the merchandising of the, of the, the legacy and um, in that way. And so, yeah, there's kind of the sky's the limit as we used to say in terms of what we can do with this line and, and how we can promote, cross promote the, the work of, of the Black Panther Party Cubs and the Huey P. Newton Foundation, as well as other, the, there's a Black Panther Party alumni will be present there at, at the, this weekend where we're installing the bust is part of a larger event. It's the 55th anniversary of the celebration of the founding of the Black Panther Party. So you're gonna have um, uh, former party members from all over. The last one was in, uh, was the 50th anniversary and you had former party members from all over the world um, coming there to, to celebrate this history. So we look forward to collaborations and support of um, any organization that is uh, working to promote this history. Yeah, and we have a couple of uh, projects coming down the line, but um, the, the next one, we're actually working on the next t-shirt for Frederica's uh, big reveal of, of the Huey P. Newton statue. So that t-shirt will be coming soon, so. Thank you. Um, thank you for that response. Um, there's another question from Sharda who says, uh, thanks for this great and inspiring work. I'm wondering if you might know if there is any more education about the history of Queen Mary to young people in Danish schools as a result of this incredible project. So that may thanks for this comment. question. I know that um, we've been approached by many um, teachers and people who work in publishing industry who are now incorporating um, the legacy of Queen Mary in the history, uh, in the history books in Denmark. So I haven't really, I, I can't keep track on how many, but I know that uh, that Queen Mary is actually now she's she's uh, the, the sculpture is being used as um, history material for uh, the younger kids, which is really really great. Mm -hmm. uh, although we also we we still have to of course um, kind of be careful how it is presented. Um, but um, it's just it's just a big step forward that people are now incorporating this and and that as, as the school kids are coming to to the site and also now we're actually having a show in the National Gallery in Denmark the SMK and I was told that there are so many school classes coming by and also uh, to watch our um, our um, contribution which is um, it's called uh, I am Queen Mary work in progress. And um, it's um, it's 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 a it's a scaffolding structure with a big banner of the, the sculpture, and uh, then we have some we have a video uh, interview with with both Levon and I, and then we have our um, crowdsource funding interview or video, and then we have some of our um, some of our uh, pieces uh, art pieces each of our art pieces that kind of shows how we got into this project. So um, yeah, so if people here from Denmark, if they want to see something, they should go and, and check this out in SMK. It's called uh, After the Storm. And it's an exhibition with only female uh, artists from 100 years uh, ago up till now. Um, women who did something really remarkable uh, with uh, very powerful statements. So we're very, um, grateful to be part of that exhibition. Yeah, I, I just want to piggyback on that, that's saying that 
that work that's being shown at the Danish National Gallery right now is really unique because it, it does really um, kind of unfold how uh, both of Jeanette and myself's artistic practices have kind of intersected with this project. I am Queen Berry. It's, it really is a merging of our, of our bodies, nations, narratives, and also our artistic practices. And I think it's, um, that's, it's like a very beginning of uh, being able to see that. And I feel like um, this collaboration with All Power to the People Project is another kind of um, important intersection of different narratives um, and intertwining of different narratives and histories. And I think, um, you know, again, we're, we're really grateful that you guys allowed us to, to do that and to have this collaboration. And um, we, again, encourage people um, to support our project, um, maybe Jeanette can yeah, I'll, I'll do the link again. Um, and you can also support it, you know, by sharing about it, uh, following us on Instagram. Uh, I am Queen Mary official. And, um, you know, cause this is also again about legacy building and legacy work and, and narrative building, which is so much what legacy work is doing. It's about building narratives and creating new worlds. So with that, I see anybody? somebody that wants to say something. Oh, one more question. Okay, yeah. sure. <laughs> of course. I mean, if we have enough time for one more yeah. question. Um, <laughs> on the strength of um, multi-perspectivity in terms of who gets to share the narratives about our historical figures, um, I can't remember who mentioned it, but the way that Queen Mary was referred to in the archives was as a negative person against the establishment of the state at the time as a terrorist. And so I'm just wondering if there are opportunities for other people right. to work in the archives to actually include other narratives that represent her truer to what she actually means to the people and the revolutionary steps that she took for liberation um, for those communities. So I don't know if, so I guess this is geared towards Levon because you're from the Virgin Islands. So I'm wondering if there are, I know it's um, public memory through childhood songs, which I'm very interested in as well, but are there any archival documents about Queen Mary that people have tapped into that could be a public resource for education? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, so I just posted in the chat some work that I'm doing with another collaboration of amazing women. It's called the Virgin Island Studies Collective. And we're four women um, spanning the different islands in the Virgin Islands from St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix, and spanning different disciplines. So it's myself, a visual artist, Tiffany Yannick, who's a writer and a poet, um, Tammy Navarro, who is an anthropologist, and Hadia Sur, who's an Africana studies major and a philosopher. And um, so we have been doing interventions with the archives and different kinds of work. And recently we came out with an article called Ancestral Queendom, um, reflections on the 1878 uh, labor revolt prison records of the Queens. So we looked at the four prison records of the Queens and do analysis and kind of critical fabulation and speculation around those prison records, but each from our different disciplines. So we each take one queen and we do that. So that's some of the work that we've been doing, which is, as you mentioned, it's so important for us as Virgin Islanders to also begin to have access to those records because we will tell different stories. Um, so I put the, the post to the link in that article and it's, it's, it's amazing. And we're also planning a conference next year. Um, and we're not, you know, working again with some of the, the Danish colonial archives, but we're also gonna be working with our archives. Um, you know, as Frederica, you mentioned that you, you, the Black Panther Party has this tremendous archive and I don't know how much people have really engaged with it. But for us, we had a figure called David Hamilton Jackson who created the first free press um, in the early 1900s. And that was a newspaper. Um, that gave a counter narrative to all the colonial indoctrination that was going on at the time. And that newspaper hasn't really been analyzed or studied by Virgin Islands, or even though it was produced here. Um, we, so that is part of what we're gonna be doing in the conference next year. We don't have a website for VSCO, um, Virgin Islands Studies Collective, but you can follow us on Facebook um, and kind of keep abreast of the work that we've been doing. So thanks for that question. Would you also 
like another scholar to help out because I work in archives. I'm an ethnomusicologist um, finishing, I'm defending right now, but I, it's a cultural anthropology, but I've been working in archives for the past four years. So yeah. what is I've, your first and last name? Cause it just came up as LW because we can definitely connect. Laren Williams. I would okay. love Maybe to help you out. Maybe if you could send your email. Yeah, you can send it to me. That would be great in the chat. I also wanted to just mention that Hela Steenum, the researcher who initiated this project in the beginning, she's actually also creating a, an archive of the fire burn. Um, so um, yeah. yeah, it's called, um, I'll put that in the link too. It's called Fireburn Files Network or Fireburn Files, maybe DK. Um, what's really interesting about this project um, you know, I am Queen Mary. It's it's like it's kind of constantly like bringing in and expanding and connecting to other projects like we have with All Power to the People. But Halastanum has been doing, you know, one of the things that really came out of the centennial. It was a, I don't know if it was really a reparations gesture, but you know, the Danish government took all of their records of what happened after the sail and transfer. They sent an archivist to the Virgin Islands and basically collected all of their furniture, documents. They even took artifacts from the indigenous um, Taino peoples, which would predate them. They took all of those artifacts as well. And are, they are currently housed in institutions in Denmark. And um, so we've kind of been this community that's had to create our memory without our records, um, which is why uh, different oral traditions and reenactments play so prevalent in the way that we remember, but it also has created a huge vacuum in knowledge here as well. Um, and so what Hella Stenham's project is about, in particular with the Fireburn Labor Revolt, is trying to bridge the Danish colonial archives, and she's been getting volunteers to help go through the thousands of records and court trial records that have been created and getting people to translate them so other people, including Virgin Islanders or people who don't speak Danish can be able to access them. But also trying to marry that knowledge with the incredible amount of oral traditional knowledge that exists in the Virgin Islands and trying to create a plat an online platform that has um, both of those knowledge systems without hier creating a hierarchy around them. Because I think that there's sometimes a, a worship of the written document in a way that prioritizes often European knowledge. And then we kind of don't see the same value as to oral traditions and song traditions and folk traditions that also have another very powerful uh, knowledge system. So that project um, I put in the link so people can take a look at that as well. Excellent. Yeah, I just also just um, put up a link to a great article written by uh, Michael Wilson, um, scholar Michael Wilson and Matthias Denbolt um, about I Am Queen Mary and what it means and um, for people to, to, um, to read if you want. Mm -hmm. So I think we are about to close down. If anyone has any questions, please come forward. Um, otherwise, I think we, we should wrap up. Um, what can you just one more time state the name of the collective? It's the yeah, I'll put, it, I'll put it in the chat. It's called the, um, the Virgin Islands Studies Collective. Okay. Or um, the acronym is VISCO. Great. This was phenomenal. Thank everyone mm -hmm. so much for sharing your insights and doing this incredibly impactful work. It is so important. Thank you so much. I'm just going to put the, the link for our crowdfunding campaign once more, just for if anyone haven't gotten it yet. <laughs> and please share it and visit and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We just have about what, six, six, seven more days left in the campaign. Yeah. And we still have quite a lot of money to raise. So, yeah. you know, one of part, you know, we've been doing a lot of events during our card source funding campaign so that it's not just about like, hey, we're raising money, but also to try to create value and create conversations because as a public art project, you know, it isn't just about the actual material sculpture. It is so much about the dialogues that have been created. And I think that that's one of 
Um, another point in common that we have with the All Power to the People project is that although there's materiality around the kind of products that they've been creating, it is really much more about the conversations and the narratives that can be generated um, through the work that we're doing. So we appreciate you know, all of you guys who mm -hmm. um, joined us today and um, you know, we appreciate your support as we continue to do this work. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been awesome. Yeah. Please reach out. I Sorry. Think we, form. I said, please reach out in any way or form, and let us also know how we can continue to support uh, mm -hmm. the project. You know, beyond sharing, but if there's other things we need to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we love the T-shirts. You should yeah, really good. check them out. I mean, this one is is perfect. It's brilliant. There's also a black on black, which is also really cool. Um, but you can see it and it's limited edition. That's also really um, yeah. very uh, important to say. So it will only be this, uh, these uh, t-shirts yeah, for, the, for the crowdfunding um, campaign. So <laughs> yeah, so they'll be very- I'll be getting the tote bags. Come yeah, on. sure, sure, sure. <laughs> and hoodies as well. Yes, hoodies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, All right. Well, thank you everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank All you. Right. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye. We're facing this.